So everything should be set. I just also started recording, so I think we can start our class. Just to check if you don't see me probably. OK, but uh, I think it's a small image, so we can also skip it. Uh, OK. So <coughs> we are talking about uh, liquid propellants, and we have classified them in uh, oxidizer and fuels, in bipropellant and monopropellants. And in case of bipropellants, we have classified them as oxidizers and fuels. And we also listed a number of uh, properties uh, which are of interest in selecting a fuel or an oxidizer, a propellant in general. And these are related to uh, density, vapor pressure, freezing point, uh, boiling point, uh, critical uh, pressure and temperature, and uh, capability to work as a coolant. <clears throat> and of course, all the other properties that make a substance suitable to be stored for a short or long time in tanks. That means the, the, the interaction between the propellant and uh, the, con the, the vessel that contains the propellant. So in this case, uh, our propellant tanks, of course, there, can, there should be a compatibility. Uh, we have talked about uh, gaskets and O-rings. We have talked about the safety provisions that have to be considered one once you are handling a, a propellant, all these properties that we listed the last time are of course important in identifying the possible use of one of the substances among the many that have been studied in, uh, uh, in selecting at the end uh, a limited number of, practical, of propellants of practical interest. So we uh, started our uh, uh, list of detailed properties of uh, of propellants with oxidizers. And we uh, mentioned last time just the first oxidizer, which is oxygen, that we consider. And we have seen its properties. So today, we continue the list of uh, the most important oxidizers. So the call that we have mentioned, oxygen, O2, which is a cryogenic propellant, recall. That means that it's to be brought at low temperature to get it in a liquid phase. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but we also talked about the level of cryogenicity. So we talk of oxygen as a mild cryogenic or space storable propellant also, because there is something that is hard cryogenic that has been distinguished from, from it. Uh, among the storable oxidizers, the most common one is nitrogen tetroxide, at least today. You find it also with uh, the, the acronym NTO or with the chemical formula and 204. So tetroxide, because we have four atoms of oxygen. And actually, we, we exploit this oxygen. So as the oxidizer, the reaction will be oxidized by the presence of this oxygen rather than of the nitrogen whose role is to bring together in a liquid phase and storable conditions the useful oxygen atoms. Uh, the molar mass is 92 kilogram per kilomol. And we have to identify the properties that we mentioned. So here it's useful to make reference to this 
PT diagram where we'll always say something roughly like, like this, with this line more or less vertical, which is the freezing point, which is not much dependent on pressure. So here we have that the tribal point is at 260 Kelvin, 0.16 bar. Then we have our normal condition here at one bar. And uh, of course, the critical point here. So we can identify here our normal boiling point, which occurs at uh, 294 Kelvin. And actually, the normal freezing point will be 262 Kelvin, so more or less the same. And the critical point will be about 100 bar. And uh, 431 Kelvin. So you can see that uh, if we consider a standard temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, that means 288 Kelvin, you find that we have this propellant and liquid phase. So to be here at this position. So this is, of course, the liquid region and the solid one and the vapor one. So this is uh, the reason why we talk of this as a storable propellant. And you can also see that if we store it at higher pressure, the range of uh, liquid phase will extend also to higher temperatures. Because, of course, if we have here this 21 degree Celsius at one bar at the vaporization condition, as the boiling condition, it, it seems that range for liquid phase could be too small. Because in a day where we have 25 degrees Celsius, it means that we would vaporize our N204. But if we store it at a slightly higher pressure, you see that range will increase and in principle if you store at very high pressure you can also reach 431 kelvin so this is a storable propellant uh, we said about the freezing point which is good uh, but uh, you see that it's not so low that the freezing point is something that you cannot do much in working with pressure. So <clears throat> you have that this 260 is a limit and is minus 13 degrees Celsius, which is not very low. So we have to avoid that we reach these, uh, these temperatures. <clears throat> and another property that we have talked about as one important because tell us tell us how much room we need to store this propellant is its density. And uh, <clears throat> we mentioned this as specific gravity. That means if I write specific gravity, it's the density with respect to liquid water. So it should be a number because it's a ratio. It should be 1.447. And the same is to say that the density is 1.447 gram per cubic centimeter or 1.447 kilogram per liter. Uh, we have vapor pressure. Of course, you see vapor pressure is this one. This is vapor pressure. And of course, if we are at, uh, for instance, 20 degree Celsius, that means 293 Kelvin, we are more or less at the normal boiling point. That means slightly lower temperature. That means 
that uh, the vapor pressure will be more or less one bar or something less than one bar. So in fact, we have that this vapor pressure is 0.95 bar uh, 293, 293 Kelvin or 4.1 bar. Uh, three, uh, 328 Kelvin. So you see that if we move here at four bar, that can be a reasonable pressure in tanks. You have this range that extends up to uh, 50, more than 50 degrees Celsius. For the uh, property, is related to the capability to work as a coolant. And we mentioned this through the specific heat with respect to liquid water. And here we have a specific heat. This 0.37 that of water. Liquid water. <clears throat> so you see that this is uh, more or less is quite similar to oxygen. We see that we have much higher density than oxygen, and we see, of course, that we have a range of existence of the liquid phase, which is in the uh, normal temperature range. So it can be considered a uh, storable and. Uh, this is so it's a high density uh, liquid with yellow brown colors. And uh, the problem is that is the, this range of existence in liquid phase. So sometimes for space is too, too high, the freezing point temperature and some blend of nitrogen tetroxide with other nitrogen oxides is considered to have to, to lower the freezing point. Note also that we actually this nitrogen tetroxide is toxic product that uh, produces uh, a poisonous vapor and also is a slightly corrosive uh, substance. So the, uh, what I was saying before is that we, depending on the goal that we are considering in using this propellant, because you can use it as an oxidizer in a launcher with storable propellants, and there are many launchers that have been uh, using this, this uh, oxidizer because of its storability. In general, uh, the, the oxygen will give you more performance but this can be stored for long times. And so especially if you think of a possible use for a, a ballistic missile, you, you can understand that having this ready is a, a possible advantage. So different uh, rockets has been built with this oxidizer. And then of course the technology has been used for both purposes of missiles and also for rocket reaching orbit. There are rockets which are based on all stages with this oxidizer. On the other hand, we have the use in space. And the use in space typically will uh, ask us more, uh, more concerns about this freezing point here. So when uh, we use this oxidizer in space, and it has been widely used to, we have uh, to consider actually some MON, that is an acronym to say mixed oxides of nitrogen, where we add a certain percentage of NO 
uh, to our propellant. So our propellant will be a blend of NO and 204. There will be also N2, uh, NO2, but NO2 will uh, uh, change in N204 if we put it in, in it. So <clears throat> you can consider adding this NO allow you to lower this freezing point and in particular if you have for instance 3% of uh, NO in this mixer you can lower the just a little the, 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 the temperature, the freezing temperature, the, the normal value that should be here 262 is lowered with 3% to 258 and 25% you lower it to the value of 218k. So you can use this blend, it's a common one, has been, uh, this, are the, this is the range between 3 and 25% more or less. And uh, this has been also called, the first one is Mon3, or more than 25 to take into account the relative amount of NO within the mixture. <clears throat> so keep this in mind. This is the, the most common, the most commonly used storable oxidizer today. Another oxidizer which is no longer used because of uh, its toxicity and uh, because also of corrosivity is, uh, but uh, it's worth to be mentioned as it's been used in the past and because of its uh, properties is the nitric acid. chemical formalis HNO3. So you recognize in oxidizer, we always have a good amount of one of the oxidizers we know because we, at atomic scale, we have seen that the oxidizer are the oxygen, chlorine and chlorine are the main oxidizer of interest. And so you recognize also here an important presence of oxygen. The molar mass here is 63, And of course, we have always more or less the same PT diagram. And the uh, not, notable not point, the tripod point is, uh, I don't have tripod point, doesn't matter. We have that as the freezing point is 232. So you see that it's quite lower than uh, NTO, and you have a boiling point of 356 Kelvin. So you see that this range is very nice for a storable uh, propellant. And the critical temperature is 650. Critical pressure 80 bar. So, <clears throat> moreover, so you see here a wide range uh, in a liquid phase for starting from 200. 32 Kelvin, that means minus 40 degrees Celsius up to 356, which is about 80 uh, degrees Celsius. So it's a nice range for liquid phase at normal conditions. And moreover, we see also specific gravity of 
1.55, which is, you see, is even higher than NTO. We have 1.1 for oxygen, 1.4 for uh, NTO, and 1.5 here for nitric acid. Being the, the, this, the, the boiling temperature, we have that at, at uh, normal temperature, we have that vapor pressure is low. And in particular, it's also 0 0.027 at zero Celsius. But and uh, as for specific heat, or thermal capacity, we have 0 0.042, so with respect to water. So this means that it's a, a bad coolant. So this is a storable colorless liquid, uh, where, where we see uh, a high, a large temperature range, a high density, but it's, it's nitric acid is uh, highly corrosive. And uh, you can also experience uh, limited exposure to its vapors and it causes burns. So you have to be, there is a safety procedure to, to, to handle this. And uh, the, the corrosivity is one of the problems, as I mentioned, and uh, this, is, this has been tackled by considering uh, uh, a mixture, including some fluorine or, uh, uh, or hydrogen fluoride. And uh, the, so it has been uh, defined it has been used with this inhibition of uh, corrosivity by fluorine and uh, also it has been also considered with uh, mixtures with uh, uh, nitrogen oxides. In particular, if you consider the, the mixture with NO2, Uh, the uh, what was a colorless liquid will uh, will yield in this case because of the NO2. We go back to the color that we have seen for N204, and in particular, we have red brown vapors with this NO2, and so. Uh, to distinguish the case that we have and to, with respect to the case we have not it, uh, it has been the acronym that has been used in the past is to consider R, F, and A or W, F, and A. That means red fumy red fuming nitric acid or white fuming nitric acid. So this is this, this means red and means that there is NO2 and this is white. This is fuming. So the color of the papers. And uh, if you include fluorine to inhibit uh, toxicity, you have uh, different uh, acronyms that becomes I, R, F, N, A, or I, W, F, N, A. That means inhibited red fuming nitric acid and inhibited white fuming nitric acid. So this is uh, particularly this one has been widely used in the first period of development of rockets, but more or less uh, it's no longer used in the last 
50 years uh, because of uh, the hazards related to the use of this uh, oxidizer. But for historical reason, it's important to mention it. Uh, so this is our third oxidizer we have mentioned. We will mention two more. And uh, in particular, one that is it has been uh, used only in labs. It will not, it's not being considered as uh, used in, in real rockets because, again, of uh, toxicity, corrosiveness, reactivity, dangers. And this is uh, something that we know. We have seen reaction with oxidizers, which is liquid fluorine. So you know uh, the chlorine is on dry, it is most oxidizing than oxygen itself uh, on the periodic table. And so we, we can understand that this is a, an important, a good oxidizer in principle at least. And the molar mass is 38. <clears throat> and uh, we have a PT diagram, which is close to that of uh, oxygen. In fact, we have the boiling point will be eighty five Kelvin compared to ninety Kelvin of uh, the oxygen. And uh, we have a critical point here at 144 Kelvin and the critical pressure of 52 bar, which is close to what we have for the oxygen as well as the freezing temperature of about 54 Kelvin. What is different? Uh, so this is, again, you see the range where we have a, a liquid phase. You see that we have a critical temperature of 144 Kelvin, it means that also at 50 bar, we have to go to very low temperature to have a liquid phase. Even if we consider a pressure of 50 bar, you have to be at uh, less the minus 100 degrees Celsius to get liquid fluorine, like in the oxygen. So this is a cryogenic propellant too. It has to be cool to get it in liquid phase. And uh, uh, as it's similar uh, to oxygen, if we call oxygen as a mild cryogenic, liquid fluorine is a mild cryogenic too. Uh, a property which is quite different with respect to oxygen is the specific gravity, which is here 1.6. Of course, the vapor pressure will depend on the temperature you are considering, and at 65 Kelvin, you have 0 0.06 bar, but uh, it means that you are. Uh, here. <clears throat> and uh, yes, we said about that. And just the, the, as a coolant, thermal capacity uh, with respect to H2O liquid <laughs> water, we have 0.37, which is similar again to what we have seen for nitrogen tetroxide and for oxygen. So this is a cryogenic oxidizer. Uh, actually, it's the one that uh, will provide the maximum performance. It has a high density, so it's very interesting in principle. 
but it's very expensive because of extreme toxicity, corrosiveness, reactivity, and so uh, the consequence dangers and cautions that have to be uh, taken into account. So as uh, last oxidizer that uh, I would like to mention is the hydrogen peroxide that is, is used, uh, is considered as a possible oxidizer. So hydrogen peroxide that is chemical formula H2O2, and that is often called shortly peroxide in the rocket field, and uh, also it's called also high-grade hydrogen peroxide. That means usually H2O2 is found as a dilution with water, and here we are talking about uh, a dilution rate which is grade which is between 70 and 99 percent of H2O2 in the mixture. So what you use is the few, what you see, of course, what is commercially found uh, for different uses is uh, at much lower grade. So what uh, it's not 70, 99 percent, which is something ready to uh, react, but you use a few percent in uh, practical uh, uh, applications of this diluted with water. Uh, in principle, it can work as an oxidizer because you see we have enough oxygen and uh, it has to, to, but we have inside also the water molecule, which is a product of reaction typically. So it's not so efficiency, but it's interesting because it's storable and it's storable in the range. So the molar mass is 34 and the freezing point is more or less like water and the boiling point higher. So we will see that this is used as monopropellant in general it could be also used as an oxidizer. It's not widely used uh, because of uh, problems of storability in the sense that uh, it's so ready to react that it's difficult to store, uh, especially if we move towards high percentage, which means more efficiency as the oxidizer. Uh, we have uh, something that is ready to react and so it's difficult to store it for long times. Very good. So we mentioned five oxidizers, alcohol, oxygen, nitrogen tetroxide, nitric acid, fluorine, and hydrogen peroxide. We move now to fuels. So fuels we have to see on the other side of the, on the left side of the periodic table. And the first that we can consider is hydrogen. Hydrogen. H2. Molar mass is 2. And here, hydrogen is what we call a hard uh, cryogenic. So, again, this is a cryogenic fuel, as oxygen is a cryogenic oxidizer. But we say we distinguish mild cryogenic with hard cryogenic. To, to say 
that uh, the uh, what has, be, has to be considered when you use hydrogen is quite different than what is required to keep oxygen or other space storable uh, liquid pro cryogenic liquid propellants. Hydrogen has to be brought at very low temperatures. You should, uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with it. Here 20 and here is 14. So you see the values are in Kelvin here of temperature. So the critical temperature of hydrogen is 33 Kelvin minus 240 degree Celsius. Just 33 Kelvin more than above the, the absolute zero. So it's quite low temperature. The boiling temperature of oxygen was 90 Kelvin. So this is quite lower, it's much more difficult and expensive to cool. It also must be insulated much more. And we'll just, I think we'll mention also shortly some something more about this in a few minutes. So look to the range at one bar, we have the range between 14 and 20 Kelvin as the liquid phase. And in general, if you increase pressure, you can move up to 33 Kelvin. And if you go above of 13 bar, you have supercritical fluid. So it has uh, properties that doesn't seem to make it so interesting. I'll give you once uh, one more negative property. You see this molar mass. In some way, this is related to the density that we can expect for a propellant. And so if you have this low molar mass, we can expect very low density. And in fact, the specific gravity for the hydrogen is just 7% of that of water. So it means that for the same mass, you need the volume which is 14 times uh, that of a, a water tank. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very good coolant. is almost twice time as good a coolant as water. So this is the lightest and coldest propellant we consider. Of course, as I mentioned, it's a fuel. It's cryogenic fuel, low density, insulation. That means that you have bulky and heavy tanks bulky because of the low density and heavy because of the insulation too. But it's interesting because it provides with the highest performance and also because it's a good coolant. So the, 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 what has to be considered is that it is stored in materials that have to, be, to keep their properties at very low temperature because if we have is 20 Kelvin inside the tank. Also, the tank has to be, has to operate at that low temperature, at least on the side of the coolant. And possibly we have also high gradients of temperature through the walls of the, <coughs> of the coolant. That, that must be insulation to avoid to spend, uh, to waste too much hydrogen before. Uh, 
being ready for launch. Uh, so you have typically a vacuum jackets uh, that allow you to have uh, a good insulation around your tank. Another uh, aspect that usually you don't think about is that uh, if you make, you open your valve and you make the hydrogen flow within pipes up to the engine before starting it, there will be something inside your pipes. For instance, atmospheric air or uh, some water vapor. And you can see that as you, as you have this liquid hydrogen that reach this, uh, this air, immediately, because of the temperature, this air solidifies. So freezes. And this can also block the piping. So it means that if you are considering such a low uh, temperature, you have to be careful out of this. So before using, you have to purge your, your lines. That means you have to clean them, uh, uh, remove everything that can solidify because of the passage of the, such a cold uh, propellant. And so the only way is to use helium, which is the only substance that will not solidify with uh, uh, like at the temperature of like liquid hydrogen. So you have to purge the lines with helium, and after that you can work with hydrogen. <clears throat> so this is a hard cryogenic propellant that is interesting because it provides you with maximum performance. But with uh, the, the the caveats that we we have we have mentioned, then we have uh, a family of uh, fuels which are uh, the, the very known, which are hydrocarbons. So we consider. We can consider different kinds of hydrocarbons and also of uh, alcohols in general as possible uh, as possible fuels. I would like to mention here just two uh, because one of them, which is a storable one, has been widely used and this is widely used today. And this uh, you can find it with. Uh, the acronym RP1, that means rocket propellant one, and uh, is like uh, the, the the fuels for the uh, jet engines that are of course designed for the good operation required by a rocket in this case. So this is a sort of kerosene where uh, sulfur is removed almost completely and there's uh, a level of uh, general properties of safety and uh, uh, let's say handling that is suitable for rockets. So in practice, uh, when you have typically the, the, the result of uh, what you, you can obtain by petroleum, you can get different level of uh, of uh, substances, and in particular, you have uh, you you can stop or you can check the number of carbon of carbon hydrocarbons with different number of carbons in the molecule that uh, allow you to obtain a more or less suitable result. So here. Uh, of course, this is a blend of different hydrocarbons, this RP1, and uh, it can be represented as a mixture having more or less 1.97 hydrogen atoms per each carbon atom. So this is not a chemical formula, it's just the ratio between H and C 
within the blend of different uh, hydrocarbons making RP1. And in fact, the average molar mass is not 12 plus 1.97, but is 175 kg per kilogram. <clears throat> so this is a storable fuel. Uh, we have a wide range in, in liquid phase, normal conditions, it should be between 225, this is the, the, let's put it here, RP1. This is the liquid phase range. Kelvin between 225 and 460. So this is the freezing point, and this is the boiling point. And the change, the, the, the fact that I have two values on the higher side is because it depends on the specific blend you are considering. And the uh, specific gravity, we have 0.8. So you see that the fuel is always lighter, typically lighter than the oxidizer, less than one. And we have uh, also, let's see, over C H2O is 0.45, which is something better than the, the oxidizer that we have seen, but is quite less than what we have seen for hydrogen. So this is storable according to this, storable fuel. Among the, so this is a blend typically, many different hydrocarbons together. On the other hand, we have, uh, in terms of performance, uh, in general, other hydrocarbons you can in principle consider also gasoline, gasoline and also uh, the diesel oil, in principle, you can use any hydrocarbon, but in general, you don't have quite change of performance. So this is adjusted for the best property in terms of safety and storage for a long time for a rocket. Uh, on, on the other hand, you have that you can consider a pure hydrocarbon with the maximum performance instead of a blend. And this is typically what you do with the lightest hydrocarbon, which is methane. <clears throat> and well, mass is 16. But the, the being so light means also that is it's again a cryogenic fuel. And this is storable cryogenic fuel. It's not so cryogenic as the hydrogen, but still a cryogenic one. And actually the range is similar to what we have for the oxygen. So we have a slightly higher value compared to the hydrogen, to the oxygen, sorry. And this the range should be 90 and 12 Kelvin as the range of liquid phase and normal conditions. And also being light fuel, it provides a better better performance because it's light, but it also has but also it has low density. So we have here more or less 0.44 which is almost half the water compared to 7% that was hydrogen. But of course, you see that it's also more or less half than what we have with RP1. So, uh, yes, I have to consider 
also here on the the opposite is true for the quality as a coolant we have higher thermal capacity or specific heat for the methane compared to the rp1 so we see that here we have a wide liquid range an interesting storable fuel and here we see actually we don't see we see just the coolant uh, property but on the other hand we can see that this is um, as other convenient properties and they are related to performance and to the fact that uh, for instance you have much more coking in presence of uh, high number of carbons in the molecule so here we have the minimum number of carbons in the molecule so we have the least coking and shooting phenomena with methane among all the hydrocarbons and this can be also an important property and consider that another property that has to be evaluated and I will stop here now five minutes is also about the availability of propellant perhaps everywhere you need this propellant so having almost pure methane will not be so difficult and uh, this is uh, could be considered the fact that this is cheap and reasonably safe and has also good properties in terms of performance so we stop now now uh, uh usual 10 minutes and uh, we will resume at 120 and to to close the, the lecture at two o'clock
So <clears throat> can almost resume and uh, we continue with uh, 
storable propellants, storable fuels in this case, we have seen that we have, we have focused so far in among fuels, in two cryogenic fuels, hydrogen and methane, and a storable fuel, which is RP1. Another important family of uh, storable fuel is that of, let's call them hydrazines. That means uh, fuels which are related to hydrazine. Hydrazine, so we have different uh, options here. We have hydrazine. Carrier form N N N two H four with molar mass thirty two and uh, we have something which is similar and this is was it related to this and these are called MMH or UDMH and then for instance hydrogen. 50. What are these? Uh, so CH3 is the methyl radical. And if you replace one of the hydrogens of the hydrazine with a methyl group here, you have a mono methyl hydrazine. That means you have a single group CH3 or dimethyl hydrazine which is uh, with two CH3 groups. And uh, the U here stays, means uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. That means that you have, if you have two groups, you have two possible options. One is symmetrical, another one is not, not symmetrical. And this is the reason we have this prime. So MMH, means mono methyl hydrogen. And UDMH unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrogen. So the chemical formula will be N2H3, and here you have CH3, or N2H2 and CH3 twice. <clears throat> and the uh, molar mass will be 46 and 60. And uh, the last one is the, so you can have then mixtures using hydrazine and MMH or UDMH. One interesting mixture is that of uh, UDMH and then 2H4, which is this hydrazine that is 50% UDMH and 50% Hydrazine. Or you have you, you uh, I should be UDMH25. I don't remember exactly the, 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 the name that give you another uh, the case where we have 25% of UDMH and the remaining part is hydrazine. So in terms of uh, performance and of properties, they are similar to each other except for the fact that MMH and UDMH try to extend or better to lower the freezing point uh, more than extending, lowering the freezing point to, for the use, for the proper use in space. In fact, if you consider hydrazine, you have properties that are easy to be recalled because properties are similar to that of water. 
So you have freezing point at zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point more or less uh, that of water is actually it's a few degrees difference. So let's look to these properties. Boiling point in Kelvin 386, 361, you see that is being lowered as you move towards uh, more complex molecules. And this is, in general, we like to have a high boiling point, but it's high enough that we can reduce it without problems. Whereas uh, this is what is important here is to lower the freezing point and from 275 to 220 here and 216 for UDMH. Among the properties, of hydrazine, another property uh, shared with water, more or less, is that of uh, specific gravity, which is 1.0. And uh, we have lower values for MMH and UDMH. And for C or C, H2O, so the uh, specific heat, we have 0 0.74, 0 0.69, and 0.65. So you see that common problem fuels are all typically better than oxidized coolants. So this is why when you are cooling, you typically will select a fuel, and density is typically lower than oxidized. But you see here, in principle, you have a high density as a fuel for the hydrazine. So uh, these are all storable fuels. The fact is that the, the only important aspect is that they are toxic. And uh, in particular, reasons to consider MMH and UDMH is that you you reduce the level of toxicity with respect to hydrazine. Just a, a little amount of levels of hydrazine can be carcinogenous, and uh, so they should be dealt with with, uh, with safety rules that, of course, are expensive. Uh, the good property is like NTO, we have uh, uh, storage for locking times. And uh, other reasons to move from N2H4 towards the, the other hydrazines is that MMH and UDMH are more stable than hydrazine. So we'll talk uh, uh, shortly uh, in a few minutes about hydrazine again, because it's also a monopropellant. And this is, recall that there is some relation between being a monopropellant and being more or less stable. As will be clear uh, again shortly. So just uh, I'd like to, to make here a summary of what you have seen in terms of fuel and oxidizers. We have a line of temperature here from 0, 100, 200. And let's see the where we are with different 
fuel sen oksidaatio. Yeah. Okay, not this one. <clears throat> so hydrogen, if this is 50, 20 should be here. So start with hydrogen, hydrogen will be in liquid phase here. If this is more or less 50, we see that the range of liquid phase for oxygen and fluorine will be more or less here. And we see that methane will be in this range. across the 100 Kelvin line. So there is more or less common value between this oxidizer maximum value of temperature and the minimum one of CH4. So here we see the hard cryogenic and these are what we call space sorable. And then we find now here around uh, where we should identify here a line which is important. It's our zero degrees Celsius. And the degree Celsius here. And uh, where we can also be interested to here we have minus 40. Hmm. Let's consider a range that can be of interest here as a storable propellant. More or less in this range we expect to find liquid phase and we find here that we have N204, is between 0 and 300, more or less. So it's actually here. It's typical conditions that we can find for this. For nitric acid, we, we go beyond 300. <clears throat> and uh, then we have H2O2. RP1. And then the hydrazines, starting from the hydrazine itself. And slightly shifted the values. Just to have, uh, let's say, an idea of the different ranges of temperature where we can find the different propellants. And so you can also evaluate at a glance the storability, how uh, are more or less storable the different families of propellants. <clears throat> so I have a look to it, and now we we pass to monopropellants. So. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just a moment before, uh, and uh, as I usually pre present or presented my propellants in the course of 
spacecraft propulsion is that monopropellants are something that are stable enough to be stored for a long time, for instance, in space, and unstable enough that under perturbation they will decompose, they will react. So, and we have to see what can be this perturbation. So, are interesting propellants because of simplicity. We have just a single substance we have to handle, and it's a liquid phase, so it's very interesting. And in fact, they have found a wide application for use in space when you have to make many, many cycles, many uh, burns with the same thruster. And why they are interesting? Because, of course, they provide more performance, that means less amount of propellant on board to have a given total impulse than a simply stored gas. And so they are quite interesting in this for this application. On the other hand, they are not so interesting if you have to realize large delta Vs. And the reason is that they typically have not so high performance compared to bipropellant. Uh, so they are attractive because of simplicity and among monopropellants we can mention the two most important ones that I already mentioned before. One is uh, also an oxidizer, and this is hydrogen peroxide. And another one is hydrogen. And in fact, for both, I mentioned that they have some issue related to stability, of course. But uh, both they can, can be with uh, proper uh, attention that can be considered as uh, useful more propellants. And uh, in fact, what happens is that we have, we need to have an exothermic reaction. And this exothermic reaction will be driven, will be uh, ignited, let's say, by a catalyst. So actually, the, the let's say one of the most important aspects for this one is to find the right catalyst that works, possibly, uh, let's say, with the minimum expense. And, and because sometimes you can activate a reaction just raising the temperature by considering heated worlds and making the substance flow through these heated worlds. And this would work as a catalyst, but at the cost of keeping these worlds heated. That is the cost because we have to spend power. Uh, so they provide uh, not the best performance, but uh, they are interesting for attitude control. And uh, so where we have many uh, cycles. The, specific impulse that we can get by hydrogen peroxide is on the order of 165 seconds and with H2O2 uh, sorry and with N2H4 we have order of 230 seconds and this is something related to the reaction that we realize with these propellants so you see that this is also is slower than what you have seen in solid rockets. And you see also that is we have not compared yet with bipropellants because so far we have seen bipropellants just as propellants uh, separately and not in combination with each other. So where these values come from, you can consider the decomposition reaction of hydrazine And 
to H2. And you see that this is, of course, the reverse reaction with respect to the formation reaction of hydrazine. So if this is the composition reaction, if you have a positive heat of formation of this substance and you decompose it, you have a release of energy. So this means that you expect to have a positive energy or enthalpy of formation of the hydrazine, and this is 1.5674, sorry, megajoule per kilogram. This is the enthalpy of formation of hydrazine, and of course, the enthalpy of formation of products here is zero. So when you make the difference and you get the heat of reaction, you can evaluate your theoretical value, reference value, maximum value, consider this just to have an order of magnitude and to compare possible propellants or propellant combination is not the actual value of performance, but you see here something interesting. Because here, this delta HR0 is exactly the entropy of formation of the hydrazine. And you see that by this expression, you have this specific impulse, which is less of what I've mentioned here. And uh, this is because the the composition reaction of hydrazine as an intermediate step that so this will be the complete decomposition it means that it's something that happened when you reach the equilibrium condition you have enough time to reach the equilibrium condition but you have intermediate steps and among these intermediate steps you have the formation of a molecule uh, characterized by a negative entropy formation, so a stable molecule, and this is the ammonia molecule, NH3. And uh, if you consider this step, or only this step, so you don't consider the further decomposition of ammonia, you have this balanced reaction. Let me go to the other page. You have this intermediate reaction where you have, of course, here you have to consider the same entropy of formation, but here you have to consider the entropy of formation of uh, ammonia, which is minus 2.72. So if you consider this and here, by this balanced reaction, you see that the, you can easily compute the, the mass fraction of uh, NH3. And here you say that Y NH3 is here necessarily 0.525. You get as the heat of reaction now, 1.5674, this is the enthalpy of formation of reactants per kilogram. And you have here to consider point sum of y, delta H of zero of products is minus. So you have minus here becomes pl plus. And here the result is about three.
And you see that in this way, we can realize this is th, just to recall that this. Probably we can put a zero here so that we recall the value. Probably we already did. So uh, these values are reference values. And you can see that uh, here now we have reached that uh, theoretical, we, have, we went, we exceeded these values of 130 seconds that I mentioned before. So uh, it means that in general, to reach the equilibrium condition, we'll have a fourth step, which is the, the dissociation of uh, uh, NH3 in N2 and H2. And this will be an endothermic reaction that will keep most of the energy released by this exothermic one. And overall, we have the results you've seen before. So the fact that we have these two steps allow you allow us that if we are able to make the first step proceed and second one not, you can have high performance. So the, let's say the art of the signing of uh, such a monopropellant thruster is related to how much you are able to make this reaction proceed. And this is, uh, of course, possible also because the first reaction, the exothermic one, as is characterized by a small time, characteristic time of reaction, whereas the second one is a slow reaction with the composition of NH3. And this is really the fact that this is stable. It's a stable molecule. So for this reason, we can have a good performance with hydrazine uh, and, uh, and this, uh, of course, is allowed by the fact that it has been found uh, a good catalyst that allow to, uh, let's say, start hydrazine, even just passing it through this cat catalyst in liquid phase. So without uh, the unnecessary uh, pre-eating of the catalyst. And this makes uh, this kind of system practically very slightly more complicated than cold gas thruster. And this is the reason why this uh, hydrazine monopropellant thruster have been so popular during the entire space age. And uh, consider that today, uh, actually, hydrazine is dangerous, is poisonous, is toxic, and so on. So it has been banned for any use. Uh, it's still used, it's still allowed use only for space application in Europe. And uh, with, uh, let's say, some uh, delay in the application of the basic rule because a uh, substitute has not been found yet, which is as efficient as either the battery is a wider research in terms of new green propellants blends of different uh, substances that in principle could replace hydrogen with similar performance. So concerning the hydrogen peroxide, uh, as I mentioned, you have to decompose, it will decompose by this reaction. If you consider it pure, so 100%. And here you have to consider the heat of formation of H2O2 and the heat of formation of H2O. You see this is minus 13.4 megajoule per kilogram. We have already seen many times. And you have here minus 5.5. If you put again uh, together these terms and you consider the amount of H2O that you have among products and uh, you can uh, evaluate this YH2O, which is 0.53, and you obtain your rate of reaction, which is uh, 1.58. 
and you see as a result a specific impulse of 180 seconds, which is, of course, slightly more of what you have mentioned before as possible performance of H2O2. So here, what happens is that uh, as you have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in case of oxidizer, you see that we have this oxygen which is available, and here we have some oxygen which does not be used for release of energy. So in terms of monopropellant, the performance is not so high, but uh, we mentioned that it's unstable enough, so with the catalyst can be ignited, the, the decomposition reaction, and you have this release of energy. And this release of energy, it can be interesting if you are not interested to, is not looking for high temperatures, because here you have more or less 1200 Kelvin as the temperature that uh, you realize. And uh, this can be interesting for some application. And uh, I hope that we have time then to talk about this under 1200 Kelvin, yes, 1200 Kelvin as order of magnitude temperature. But performance is less than hydrazine and, and stability is less than hydrazine. So the, the hydrogen peroxide cannot be stored for long times. And so for this reason, it has not be used for uh, deep space application. But it has been used and can be still considered as a monopropellant for application in launchers, for instance, for the, uh, let's say, control systems of a launcher. So for, uh, not for the main proportion, for let's say secondary proportion of launchers, it has been considered as this monopropellant uh, as an interesting option. So uh, we, see, we saw here the performance of monopropellants. Let's go back to bipropellants and see the performance. So monopropellants, poor performance, let's say high simplicity, easy for many restarts are some concluding remarks. In terms of bipropellants, let's consider our oxidizer and fuels. This is a list of oxidizer and fuels we have mentioned. And in general, you can combine each oxidizer with the fuel, with, the, with the, one of the fuels. And uh, of course, there are combination of particular interest. We can identify here and can introduce another concept. But first of all, let's think of the storage condition. Storage condition, we can have storable combinations or uh, semi cryogenic combination. That means one of propellants is cryogenic, another one is storable or completely cryogenic combination. For instance, this one will be fully cryogenic. This one will be fully cryogenic, or for instance, this one is instead fully storable, like also this one and this one, and also this one is storable, other storable combination, and uh, yes, in principle, it's storable also this one. This is fully cryogenic too. It's fully cryogenic too. And then we have this one, for instance, which is not, is a semi cryogenic one. Just to make some example. 
So we can consider different combinations on this base of storability, but we can also classify the propellant combination on basis, based on another property, which is the, the their hypergolicity. So two uh, propellants are said to be hypergolic if they uh, activate spontaneously, they ignite spontaneously when they are put in contact with each other. So for instance, if we consider N2O4 and N2H4 or one of them, one of the hydrazines with N2O4, this makes a hypergolic, hypergolic combination. That means if you put uh, a drop of one of the propellants on the other, this will burn, will react. Is it interesting or not? Or what means the, in fact, we consider O2 and H2, they are non hypergolic. So what is better? Would it be better to be hypergolic or not? Or in other words, because better seems that it uh, drives us towards choice. Uh, do you think it can be interesting to have a hypergolic combination or not? It's interesting because you have one component less. You don't need an igniter. And this is especially important if you have to do many ignitions. And especially if you have to do, for instance, one ignition after 10 years of uh, travels in the deep space. And in this case, having a hybrid guard combination, let's say, give you more chances that uh, you uh, ignite properly your uh, propellants. So uh, we can consider the different, the most important, the most common propellant combination on basis of storability and basis on the hypergolicity. So two propellants, just to say they are hypergolic if they provide a spontaneous ignition. So <clears throat> other possible hypergolic combination would be this one, H2O2 and RP1. And uh, also the hydrogen with uh, IRFNA. So it means with uh, nitric acid. The other combination typically not hypergolic. So the, the tomorrow we'll see the we'll describe the properties that you can expect by the main propellant combination in use. And uh, so we'll discuss uh, and classify these combinations. Stop here today. Arrivederci. 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 Arrivederci.